Again, we welcome everyone here today, and if you're a guest, there are some cards at the end of the row, and we invite you to fill them out so that we can be back in touch with you. We're glad that you're here today. Let us offer a word of prayer. Holy God, we give thanks for this day and for the way that you move in our lives. We give thanks for the gift of your word, and we ask that as you promised, that it is a living word, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would make it so among us today. For we are people who are grateful and a little bit weary. We are excited about Advent, but also longing for some of these promises that you made to be manifest among us. We pray in your loving name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. So last Advent, Justin worked hard to find a new Advent hymn, and he came up with the one that we're going to sing for the hymn of, day, of the day. And when I heard it and then sung it for four weeks in a row, I knew that I really liked it. And that's where we got the theme for this Advent. And it goes like this, the chorus. There is a longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you. There's so much 
resistance that goes on. We could have a whole conversation now about how our economy is tied to war making. Amen, anyone? Or do you know how much of the carbon dioxide in the world, those problems that we're having right now with the CO2 levels that the US military contributes to, bigger than multiple countries. And so last week, the Pope, the Pope who is a prophet on the move around the globe, showed up in Nagasaki, Japan, where in 1945, 75,000 people were killed because of a nuclear weapon being dropped. And at that site, Pope Francis called for the abolition of nuclear weapons. He said he would use every power that he has in his office to remove nuclear weapons from the world. And he said he condemns nuclear weapons, their very possession. The Pope is talking about peace. Now that's too big and too demanding, right? And then it's too hard to get at. I mean, how could we do that? But maybe one of the gifts to a faith is to trust that starting small is okay too. Amen, anyone? And starting small. And so there are, there are places in the world where there is transformation of weapons of war into weapons of peace. An evangelical Christian by the name of Shane Claiborne that some of you are familiar with, and so here Sarah B. met Shane Claiborne within the last week or so, and his friend Michael Barton wrote a book about their experience in Philadelphia this past year, and it's called Beating Guns. Hope for people who are weary of violence. And so Shane Claiborne has been seeking to incarnate the ministry of Jesus in Philadelphia, and I think he almost gets it. There are some things that he cannot bear. He does not have the whole rainbow of understanding of who God is. But he's written this book about guns. And there are a lot of his fellow evangelicals who are very in favor of God, so he is not well regarded by them right now. But he started with his friend who donated an AK-47 to try to see, is there a way to really melt this gun down and turn it into something else? And so the book tells not only of all kinds of statistics about gun violence in this nation that are horrific, and keep happening. What Shane Claiborne talks about is how he and his father went and found a blacksmith who trained him how to create garden tools from guns, heating guns to 2,000 degrees, not just once, heating it and then shaping it, heating it again and then shaping it again and heating it again, and then shaping it again, and then heating it again, and then shaping it again. So that over time, it becomes steel, is shaped by steel, and the transformation is slow. But for Shane Claiborne and his friend Michael, the transformation nearby in Philadelphia has been real. And, In Mexico, in one of the cities with the highest level of gun violence, there is an artist called Pedro Reyes who decided that he was going to do an art project also around guns. And so what he did was he decided to offer a coupon for a household for something that would be beneficial for a household if they would turn in a gun to him. And he received 1,527 guns. That's a lot of coupons. And he learned also how to melt down these guns. It took a long time to melt down 1,527 guns, and he chose to turn these into 1,527 shovel heads. And he took those 1,527 
27 shovel heads, heads and put wooden handles on them and then distributed them to art institutions, public schools, and community centers with the promise that with these shovels would be planted a minimum of 1,527 trees. And they were. They were planted, demonstrating again that an agent of death can become an agent of life. The transformation can be done, but it also, in addition to our creativity as humanity, it takes our will to trust that our will for peace matches God's will for peace. And our longing for peace matches a longing that God already has for peace for all nations. All nations. Yes. Not just the winning nations. All nations. Jesus, who came to earth to incarnate God's love, to be God's love on this globe, walking around and sharing love with people by relating to people and healing people, healing people so that they would become fully alive and who they are in God's grace. Jesus kept calling people into his circle and inviting people who others would say did not belong within the proximity of God's love. Jesus came to the earth and he was called the Prince of Peace. His very being was peace as he traveled around. And this was even as he was surrounded by an empire that from an early age had not wanted him to live. Because you know the story of the leader of the empire when Jesus was born? We'll get to that at the end of December. But the preview is, is that that King Herod had heard that there was going to be another being born who would have a kind of power that would make a difference in the world, and Herod did not want that to be. So what Herod does first is sort of decree, and I'm going to go out and find, I'm going to find this child and recruit some helpers, three wise ones who are from out of town. But ultimately what happens is that Herod decides to kill all the male babies. So threatened is this empire by a kind of power that can change the world. And so Jesus does grow up because his parents became refugees. They took him out of town fast. They had to leave. And when they came back and when he grew, he was a troublemaker for the empire. The empire that was shored up by threatening violence actually did violence to Jesus by executing him publicly on a cross. The goal of the empire was to put an end to a peacemaker named Jesus. Yes. And God's response to that death was to bring Jesus back to life from the dead. And so then Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, when he goes and meets those disciples who are hiding because they are afraid, Jesus has died. They don't understand that Jesus could be risen. But as Jesus moves, as Jesus does continue to move, even today, through spaces that are supposed to be locked doors, Jesus shows up with the disciples, and what does he say to them? Peace. My peace I give you. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus breathes on them. And they receive this peace from Jesus. That kind of peace that the disciples received allowed them to transform the fear that they carried in their very being into a faith that would allow them to come outside of that locked up room and to meet people and to say, let me tell you something. I know a 
Jesus who died and who rose and who gave me peace so I may share peace with you. Amen. The Holy Spirit is breathing peace into us even today. So it was 1969 and there was a lot of stuff going on in the world, a lot of stuff going on 14th Street. And this church was one of the focal points of the anti-war movement. And I continue to meet people who've been around a while in Washington and they will tell me their stories about how when they were young, they were at Luther Place. Their community gathering was around making peace and was around saying, actually, we're not going to study war anymore. We instead are going to give ourselves into the transforming movement so that this nation will get out of the war of the time, which was Vietnam. People prayed for peace. People longed for peace. And a song in 1969 that came out from someone who had been a Beatle, John Lennon, and his wife Yoko Ono, was called, All We Are Saying Is Give Peace a Chance. Now, I grew up in a household where my father played only, he was in charge of the record player, and only played classical music. But I knew something was going on where instead of all these record covers of like either pastoral scenes or full orchestra scenes, there was a picture of four men, their faces on the cover. That first album, Hard Day's Night, I knew there was something going on and I said, Dad, are you getting new kinds of records? He's <laughs> like, no, someone gave it to me. <laughs> Trying to bring Henry Brown into contemporary lights. But if you listen to this song, as I was preparing last night this sermon, going, <clears throat> like, I get like, how difficult this time that we are in now. And when I had breakfast with Gary Mary a couple of weeks ago, he said, like, it's like as hard as it was in the 60s. And I'm like, yeah, this is a really difficult time. Well, the song that John Lennon and Yoko Ono put out starts with this whole litany of things. And it talks about all these isms going on. Then it talks about all of these different kind of spiritual leaders. And the chorus after each litany is, all we are saying is give peace a chance. And so if I... I'm honest, I was sitting down last night and I decided I was going to be more clever than John and Yoko and come up with this brilliant litany of things that are going on. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you don't have to be that smart tomorrow. <laughs> but what I do have to do, I have to encourage us to sing the chorus together. Right? Because I can hear even sitting at my dining room table, I can hear Isaiah on that mountain with the Holy One calling all the nations. And somehow the song they're singing together is all we are saying is give peace a chance. I can hear Jesus after he has breathed on those disciples and you know, not all right away. Right. Like even if Jesus has moved through the doors, is with them with holes in his hands, breathing peace on them, they don't all get it, but when they start to sing together, I hear them singing to the one that doesn't believe all we are saying is give peace a chance. And I know that some of you like are really Beatles fans right? If there are any Beatles fans in the room, oh. <laughs> sir, <laughs> and your friend, right? right? So gentlemen, can I hear you sing this song right now? Let's hear you sing the chorus. Go ahead. Too young to really 
know the Beatles to F. <laughs> but I think I can hear you singing too, because it's so hard to make these changes. But what about giving something a chance? Give it a chance. Can you sing for us? Oh, Oh, we are saying is he 